Part two of Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners by John Bunyan. Part two. Therefore, I should often make it my business to be going again and again into the company of these poor people, for I could not stay away and the more i went amongst them the more i did question my condition and as i still do remember presently i found two things within me at which i did sometimes marvel especially considering what a blind ignorant sordid and ungodly wretch but just before i was the one was a great softness and tenderness of heart which caused me to fall under the conviction of what by scripture they asserted and the other was a great bending in my mind to a continual meditating on it and all other good things which at any time i heard or read of by these things my mind was now so turned that it lay like a horse leech at the vein still crying out give give proverbs thirty fifteen yea it was so fixed on eternity and on the things about the kingdom of heaven that is so far as i knew though as yet god knows i knew but little that neither pleasures nor profits nor persuasions nor threats could loosen it or make it let go his hold and though i may speak it with shame yet it is in very deed a certain truth it would then have been as difficult for me to have taken my mind from heaven to earth as i often found it often since to get it again from earth to heaven one thing i may not omit there was a young man in our town to whom my heart was knit more than to any other but he being a most wicked creature for cursing and swearing and whoring i now shook him off and forsook his company but about a quarter of a year after i had left him i met him in a certain lane and asked him how he did he after his old swearing and mad way answered he was well but harry said i why do you swear and curse thus what will become of you if you die in this condition he answered me in a great chafe what would the devil do for company if it were not for such as i am about this time i met with some ranters books that were put forth by some of our countrymen which books were also highly in esteem by several old professors some of these i read but was not able to make a judgment about them wherefore as i read in them and sought upon them feeling myself unable to judge i should betake myself to hearty prayer in this manner o lord i am a fool and not able to know the truth from error lord leave me not to my own blindness either to approve of or condemn this doctrine if it be of god let me not despise it if it be of the devil let me not embrace it lord i lay my soul in this matter only at thy foot let me not be deceived i humbly beseech thee i had one religious intimate companion all this while and that was the poor man that i spoke of before but about this time he also turned a most devilish ranter and gave himself up to all manner of filthiness especially uncleanness he would also deny that there was a god angel or spirit and would laugh at all exhortations to sobriety when i laboured to rebuke his wickedness he would laugh the more and pretend that he had gone through all religions and could never light on the right till now he told me also that in a little time we should see all professors turn to the ways of the ranters wherefore abominating those cursed principles i left his company forthwith and became to him as great a stranger as i had been before a familiar neither was this man only a temptation to me but my calling lying in the country i happened to light into several people's company who though strict in religion formerly yet were also swept away by these ranters these would also talk with me of their ways and condemn me as legal and dark pretending that they had only attained to perfection that could do what they would and not sin oh these temptations were suitable to my flesh i being but a young man and my nature in its prime but god who had i hope designed me for better things kept me in the fear of his name and did not suffer me to accept of such principles and blessed be god who put it into my heart to cry to him to be kept and directed still distrusting my own wisdom for i have since seen even the effect of that prayer in his preserving me not only from ranting errors but from those also that have sprung up since the bible was precious to me in those days and now methought i began to look into the bible with new eyes and read as i never did before and especially the epistles of the apostle paul were sweet and pleasant to me and indeed i was then never out of the bible either by reading or meditation still crying out to god that i might know the truth and way to heaven and glory 
and as i went on and read i lighted on that passage to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit and to another faith etc first corinthians twelve eight and nine and though as i have since seen that by this scripture the holy ghost intends in special things extraordinary yet on me it did then fasten with conviction that i did want things ordinary even that understanding and wisdom that other christians had on this word i mused and could not tell what to do especially this word faith put me to it for i could not help it but sometimes must question whether i had any faith or no for i feared that it shut me out of all the blessings that other good people had given them of god but i was loath to conclude i had no faith in my soul for if i do so thought i then i shall count myself a very castaway indeed no said i within myself though i am convinced that i am an ignorant sot and that i want those blessed gifts of knowledge and understanding that other good people have yet at a venture i will conclude i am not altogether faithless though i know not what faith is for it was showed me and that too as i have since seen by satan that those who conclude themselves in a faithless state had neither rest nor quiet in their souls and i was loath to fall quite into despair wherefore by this suggestion i was for a while made afraid to see my want of faith but god would not suffer me thus to undo and destroy my soul but did continually against this my blind and sad conclusion create still within me such suppositions insomuch that i might in this deceive myself that i could not rest content until i did now come to some certain knowledge whether i had faith or no this always running in my mind but how if you want faith indeed but how can you tell if you have faith and besides i saw for certain if i had not i was to perish for ever so that though i endeavoured at the first to look over the business of faith yet in a little time i better considering the matter was willing to put myself upon the trial whether i had faith or no but alas poor wretch so ignorant and brutish was i that i knew to this day no more how to do it than i know how to begin and accomplish that rare and curious piece of art which i never yet saw nor considered wherefore while i was thus considering and being put to my plunge about it for you must know that as yet i had in this matter broken my mind to no man only did hear and consider the tempter came in with his delusion that there was no way for me to know i had faith but by trying to work some miracle urging those scriptures that seemed to look that way for the enforcing and strengthening his temptation nay one day as i was betwixt elstow and bedford the temptation was hot upon me to try if i had faith by doing of some miracle which miracle at that time was this i must say to the puddles that were in the horse pads be dry and to the dry places be you the puddles and truly one time i was a-going to say so indeed but just as i was about to speak this thought came into my mind but go under yonder hedge and pray first that god would make you able but when i had concluded to pray this came hot upon me that if i prayed and came again and tried to do it and yet did nothing notwithstanding then be sure i had no faith but was a castaway and lost nay thought i if it be so i will never try yet but will stay a little longer so i continued at a great loss for i thought if they only had faith which could do so wonderful things then i concluded that for the present i neither had it nor yet for time to come were ever like to have it thus i was tossed between the devil and my own ignorance and so perplexed especially at some times that i could not tell what to do about this time the state and happiness of these poor people at bedford was thus in a dream or vision represented to me i saw as if they were set on the sunny side of some high mountain there refreshing themselves with the pleasant beams of the sun while i was shivering and shrinking in the cold afflicted with frost snow and dark clouds methought also betwixt me and them i saw a wall that did compass about this mountain now through this wall my soul did greatly desire to pass concluding that if i could i would go even into the very midst of them and there also comfort myself with the heat of their sun about this wall i thought myself to go again and again still prying as i went to see if i could find some way or passage by which i might enter therein but none could i find for some time at the last i saw as it were a narrow gap like a little doorway in the wall through which i attempted to pass but the passage being very straight and narrow i made many efforts to get in but all in vain even until i was well-nigh quite beat out by striving to get in 
At last, with great striving, methought I at first did get in my head, and after that, by sidling striving, my shoulders and my whole body. Then I was exceeding glad, and went and sat down in the midst of them, and so was comforted with the light and heat of their sun. Now this mountain and wall, etc., was thus made out to me. The mountain signified the church of the living God, the sun that shone thereon, the comfortable shining of his merciful face on them that were therein. The wall, I thought, was the word that did make separation between the Christians and the world. And the gap which was in this wall, I thought, was Jesus Christ, who is the way to God the Father. John 14.6, Matthew 7.14 but for as much as the passage was wonderful narrow, even so narrow that I could not but with great difficulty enter in thereat, it showed me that none could enter into life but those that were in downright earnest, and unless they left this wicked world behind them, for here was only room for body and soul, but not for body and soul and sin. This resemblance abode upon my spirit many days, all which time I saw myself in a forlorn and sad condition, but yet was provoked to a vehement hunger and desire to be one of that number that did sit in the sunshine. Now also I should pray wherever I was, whether at home or abroad, in house or field, and should also often with lifting up of heart sing that of the fifty-first psalm, O Lord, consider my distress, for as yet I knew not where I was. Neither as yet could I attain to any comfortable persuasion that I had faith in Christ, but instead of having satisfaction, here I began to find my soul to be assaulted with fresh doubts about my future happiness, especially with such as these, whether I was elected. But how, if the day of grace should now be passed and gone? By these two temptations I was very much afflicted and disquieted, sometimes by one and sometimes by the other of them. And first, to speak of that about my questioning my election, I found at this time that though I was in a flame to find the way to heaven and glory, and though nothing could beat me off from this, yet this question did so offend and discourage me that I was, especially at some times, as if the very strength of my body also had been taken away by the force and power thereof. This scripture did also seem to me to trample upon all my desires. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Romans 9.16 With this scripture I could not tell what to do, for I evidently saw that unless the great God of his infinite grace and bounty had voluntarily chosen me to be a vessel of mercy, though I should desire and long and labor until my heart did break, no good could come of it. Therefore this would still stick with me. How can you tell that you are elected? And what if you should not? How then? O oh Lord, thought I, what if I should not indeed? It may be you are not, said the tempter. It may be so indeed, thought I. Why then, said Satan, you had as good leave off and strive no further. For if indeed you should not be elected and chosen of God, there is no talk of your being saved. For it is neither of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. By these things I was driven to my wit's end, not knowing what to say or how to answer these temptations. Indeed, I little thought that Satan had thus assaulted me, but that rather it was my own prudence thus to start the question. For, that the elect only attained eternal life, that I without scruple did heartily close with all, but that myself was one of them, there lay all the question. Thus, therefore, for several days I was greatly assaulted and perplexed, and was often, when I had been walking, ready to sink where I went, with faintness in my mind. But one day, after I had been so many weeks oppressed and cast down therewith, as I was now quite giving up the ghost of all my hopes of ever attaining life, that sentence fell with weight upon my spirit. Look at the generations of old, and see. Did ever any trust in the Lord, and was confounded? at which I was greatly lightened and encouraged in my soul. For thus at that very instant it was expounded to me. Begin at the beginning of Genesis, and read to the end of the Revelations, and see if you can find that there was ever any that trusted in the Lord and was confounded. So coming home I presently went to my Bible to see if I could find that saying, not doubting but to find it presently, for it was so fresh and with such strength and comfort on my spirit that I was as if it talked with me. Well, I looked, but I found it not. Only it abode upon me. Then I did ask first this good man, and then another, if they knew where it was, but they knew no such place. 
At this I wondered that such a sentence should so suddenly and with such comfort and strength seize and abide upon my heart, and yet that none could find it, for I doubted not, but it was in holy scripture. Thus I continued above a year, and could not find the place. But at last, casting my eye into the Apocrypha books, I found it in Ecclesiasticus 2.10. This at the first did somewhat daunt me, but because by this time I had got more experience of the love and kindness of God, it troubled me the less, especially when I considered that though it was not in those texts that we call holy and canonical, yet for as much as this sentence was the sum and substance of many of the promises, it was my duty to take the comfort of it, and I blessed God for that word, for it was of God to me, that word doth still at times shine before my face." After this, that other doubt did come with strength upon me. But how if the day of grace should be past and gone? How if you overstood the time of mercy? Now I remember that one day, as I was walking into the country, I was much in the thoughts of this. But how if the day of grace be past? And to aggravate my trouble, the tempter presented to my mind those good people of Bedford, and suggested thus unto me, that these being converted already, they were all that God would save in those parts, and that I came too late, for these had got the blessing before I came. Now was I in great distress, thinking in very deed that this might well be so. Wherefore I went up and down, bemoaning my sad condition, counting myself far worse than a thousand fools for standing off thus long and spending so many years in sin as I had done, still crying out, Oh, that I had turned sooner! Oh, that I had turned seven years ago! It made me also angry with myself to think that I should have no more wit but to trifle away my time till my soul and heaven were lost. But when I had been long vexed with this fear and was scarce able to take one step more, just about the same place where I received my other encouragement, these words broke in upon my mind. Compel them to come in, that my house may be filled, and yet there is room. Luke fourteen twenty two and 23. These words, but especially them, and yet there is room, were sweet words to me. For truly I thought that by them I saw there was place enough in heaven for me, and moreover that when the Lord Jesus did speak these words, he then did think of me, and that he, knowing that the time would come that I should be afflicted with fear that there was no place left for me in his bosom, did before speak this word, and leave it upon record, that I might find help thereby against this vile temptation. This I then verily believed. In the light and encouragement of this word I went a pretty while, and the comfort was the more when I thought that the Lord Jesus should think on me so long ago, and that he should speak these words on purpose for my sake. For I did then think, verily, that he did on purpose speak them, to encourage me withal. But I was not without my temptations to go back again. Temptations, I say, both from Satan, mine own heart, and carnal acquaintance. But I thank God these were outweighed by that sound sense of death and of the day of judgment, which abode as it were continually in my view. I should often also think on Nebuchadnezzar, of whom it is said, He had given him all the kingdoms of the earth. Daniel 5.19 Yet, I thought, if this great man had all his portion in this world, one hour in hell fire would make him forget all. Which consideration was a great help to me. I was almost made about this time to see something concerning the beasts that Moses counted clean and unclean. I thought those beasts were types of men, the clean, types of them that were the people of God, but the unclean, types of such as were the children of the wicked one. Now I read that the clean beast chewed the cud, that is, thought I, they showed us we must feed upon the word of God. They also parted the hoof. I thought that signified we must part, if we would be saved, with the ways of ungodly men. And also in further reading about them I found that though we did chew the cud as the hare, yet if we walked with claws like a dog, or if we did part the hoof like the swine, yet if we did not chew the cud as the sheep, we were still, for all that, but unclean. For I thought the hare to be a type of those that talk of the word, yet walk in the ways of sin, and that the swine was like him that parted with his outward pollutions, but still wanteth the word of faith, without which there could be no way of salvation let a man be never so devout. Deuteronomy 14. After this I found, by reading the word, that those that must be glorified with Christ in another world must be called by him here, 
called to the partaking of a share in his word and righteousness and to the comforts and first fruits of his spirit and to a peculiar interest in all those heavenly things which do indeed forfeit the soul for that rest and house of glory which is in heaven above here again i was at a very great stand not knowing what to do fearing i was not called for thought i if i be not called what then can do me good none but those who are effectually called inherit the kingdom of heaven but oh how i now love those words that spake of a christian's calling as when the lord said to one follow me and to another come after me and oh thought i that he would say so to me too how gladly would i run after him i cannot now express with what longings and breakings in my soul i cried to christ to call me thus i continued for a time all on a flame to be converted to jesus christ and did also see at that day such glory in a converted state that i could not be contented without a share therein gold could it have been gotten for gold what could i have given for it had i a whole world it had all gone ten thousand times over for this that my soul might have been in a converted state how lovely now was every one in my eyes that i thought to be converted men and women they shone they walked like a people that carried the broad seal of heaven about them oh i saw the lot was fallen to them in pleasant places and they had a goodly heritage psalm sixteen six but that which made me sick was that of christ in mark he went up into a mountain and called to him whom he would and they came unto him mark three thirteen this scripture made me faint and fear yet it kindled fire in my soul that which made me fear was this lest christ should have no liking to me for he called whom he would but oh the glory that i saw in that condition did still so engage my heart that i could seldom read of any that christ did call but i presently wished would i had been in their clothes would i had been born peter would i had been born john or would i had been by and heard him when he called them how would i have cried o lord call me also but oh i feared he would not call me and truly the lord let me go thus many months together and showed me nothing either that i was already or should be called hereafter but at last after much time spent and many groanings to god that i might be partaker of the holy and heavenly calling that word came in upon me i will cleanse their blood that i have not cleansed for the lord dwelleth in zion joel three twenty one these words i thought were sent to encourage me to wait still upon god and signified unto me that if i were not already yet time might come i might be in truth converted to christ End of part two.